This was once a lake, 30 miles long and up to 100 feet deep, shimmering blue and gray from the desert sky and the mountains. This lake is now dead, dried up completely, a haunting place of salt bed and mud with its unique fisheries and wildlife gone forever. It used to be called Lake Winnemucca, and in the words of the Indian people who lived here, it was murdered. It was murdered by the white man. What happened to Lake Winnemucca is about to happen to one of the world's last great and beautiful inland seas, which lies just a few miles from here in a long hidden basin in the state of Nevada. It's called Pyramid Lake. This film is about the death of Pyramid Lake and of the gentle Paiute people who depend on it as if its waters were their blood. It's a story that not only tells again the plight of the American Indian, God knows the orgies of remorse and guilt the American Indian inspires seem only to cause even more frantic attempts to make him disappear. No, the story of Pyramid Lake is much more universal than that. For it tells very simply what we all achieve when we knowingly and culpably destroy the partnership between man and nature. The state of Nevada lies in the far west of America, landlocked and arid. Straddling the Nevada state line is Lake Tahoe, fed by the melting snows of the mountains that surround it. The waters of Lake Tahoe used to spill down the Truckee River and feed the uniquely beautiful lakes Winnemucca and Pyramid. But in 1905, ignoring the interests of the Indians, the government built a dam across the Truckee River to serve the few white squatters who had settled nearby. As a direct result of this, water was diverted by canal to irrigate the white squatters' farms in an area called the Newlands Project. The water that was left was not enough to save Winnemucca Lake from extinction, nor to preserve Pyramid Lake from a slow death. Pyramid Lake has belonged to the Paiute American Indians for 4,000 years, and now they themselves face the same slow death. Our land here, uh, straight over that way, see, part of it gone. That far the water come closer. We got fish all we want, we never get hungry. Down in this river, my father go out, hook them, good, good life. And uh, my father take a long pole, you know, put sharp, uh, curled up, what you call it, iron, just hook them down there when you see fish swimming along back and forth, just snack them, snag them, quick. I think that's the way they kill them, catch them. Now they got uh, some kind of pole of fish in the lake all the time, not in here. No more fishing through the river. cook it and cut them up and cook it with children eat. No wind like this, nice air. We sit around under a shady tree and eat all we want. We get anything. Wild game, we eat deer, ducks, rabbits, all, everything. Fish. That was free to us long time ago, but now they make law against everything and shut us out. Oh, white man, uh, leave, take our land away from us, the best land, California, and uh, leave comfortable, build homes there, multiplying, push us away into Rocky Mountains. Rocky place, no good place. We used to have dance going on here, and buckskin work, and old people fix a deer hide into shoes, box and shoes, fix it like that. That's all gone now. The language is gone, too. Nowadays, uh, every little kid uh, talk English. No, they forgot their Paiute talk. Oh, the 
singer, the singer, and no singer did, did to die, and nobody start singing. You can't hear anybody sing now. Used to be old Indians lived down that way, and early in the morning somebody come along over the hill there singing loud, happy, happy man going along on horseback, going along and singing away. We used to hear that. Nowadays, nobody make noise like that. Nobody sing. Nobody don't know how to sing. You don't see 100 men walk around, old people. They're all gone, all forgotten. The singers all dead and gone. The evidence of Pyramid Lake's imminent murder is here for everybody to see. 80 feet of water have already gone since the government's dam was built. The point of no return has almost been reached, as I am shown by the tribe's fishery expert on a trip to the pyramid-shaped rock from which the lake takes its name. Another 80 feet will turn the lake into a useless, lifeless salt bed. Where was the level of water before the dam was built? Well, do you see up there in the day 1924? Yeah. Oh, I'd say approximately 40 feet above that. Oh. There's a ridge there and another, another 20 or feet so. So it was up to there. In 1924, the water was there. Right. And, and then before the dam, it was about late another, last century, it was... About another, approximately another 40 feet uh, from in, here. Yes, that's, that's almost like the disappearance of a sea, isn't it? And that's what one dam has done to Pyramid Lake. That's correct. At this rate of, of dropping, how serious is it if it goes on at this rate? Well, if it continues on uh, at the same rate, which is approximately 80 feet in the last, oh, 70 years, since 1905 when Derby Dam was installed, uh, I would imagine by the turn of the century uh, the fisheries would be uh, eliminated entirely. All the fish would be? Uh, it would be too difficult for them to survive. The, the bicarbonates in the lake would be uh, you know, essentially too high for them. The Pyramid Lake Reservation, like all Indian reservations, is run by the Department of the Interior in Washington, which by law is responsible for the tribe's well-being. When the department built Derby Dam, the Paiute found themselves in an incredible position. To get their water back, they had to sue the very government department responsible for looking after their interests. So the tribe went to the law and fought their way right up to the Supreme Court, which in 1972 ordered water diverted back into Pyramid Lake. But all they're still getting is this pathetic trickle, because in spite of the court's ruling, there was another catch for the Indians. The whites who use the water and operate the dam say the court's decision has nothing to do with them. So now the government must sue each one of the water users at a cost of millions of dollars and years in time. Meanwhile, as the Indians' water pours away and the case drags on and on, Pyramid Lake is dying and one lake is already dead. In 1937, I witnessed some of these chubs. They called the tui fish, the rough fish. They were on their way out. They just lined the shorelines. Some of them were already dead. Some of them were just barely moving. And some of them you could see they're, they're turning upside down. I saw this happen. And then when this finally fizzled out, the uh, lake dried out, uh, I believe in 1939, the waterfowl left and they, they headed for the Stillwater area down below Fallon. And that's where uh, they, they are. I think uh, your northern flyway that comes in through this area, they, they go down there. They headed to the area that's been irrigated at the expense of Lake Winnemucca. Right, yeah, the expense of Lake uh, Winnemucca and also uh, uh, Pyramid Lake. And that's where the ducks are now. And then uh, they have a, a duck club there, which, uh, which uh, 
you have to join their club before you can hunt down there. I've never hunted down there. The white men you know. take the water and they take the wildlife that goes That's with right. it. That's right. That's the way it went. Mm. And they murdered the fish, I would say. It's just a murder is what it is. Because they, this fish had no chance to get out. And that's why I always say Derby Dam was the... was a murderer. In this place, late last century, two decisive battles were fought between the U.S. Army and the warriors of the Paiute tribe. The official version of what happened lords the courage of the noble savage against, as it puts it, the superior forces of the Caucasian army. A Hollywood screenwriter could not have put it better. The truth, of course, is that the Indians have never won, and their struggle today at Pyramid Lake is just one of hundreds of battles still being fought. Battles over water rights, land rights, mineral rights, the right to survive. Some years ago, I met the son of the great Red Cloud, chief of the Sioux Nation. He showed me the words his father had spoken on the day of the final defeat of the entire Indian nation. Red Cloud was speaking on behalf of all Indians when he said with scornful irony, now that you've been forced to surrender, you must put aside the wisdoms of your fathers. You must lay up food and ignore the hungry. And when your house is built and your storeroom filled, you must look around for a neighbor to take advantage of and seize all he has. That's the way it is now, the way to get rich, the way of the white man. Nowhere is the extravagant waste of Pyramid Lake's water more obvious than around the town of Fallon, center of the Newlands project. Only a sixth of the white man's land has been cultivated and much of the water diverted from Pyramid Lake has soaked into arid land and created a so-called sportsman's reserve to which the dying lake's wildlife has fled. For all the hardship it has caused the Indians, the government's irrigation scheme has been a failure. In Nevada, a desert state, there are no water controls and water is squandered. This, the biggest ranch in the area, uses more water than any other. It belongs to Nevada State Senator Carl Dodge, who promotes the interests of the Newlands ranchers against the rights of the Indians. So, assuming that they've been wronged, and assuming that the present public interest would best be served by the, leaving the water where it presently is and the, under its present uses, I've always felt that the proper thing to do would be to settle with the Indians uh, on a, uh, by paying them in money damages, the federal government paying them in money damages. And we have a lot of precedent for that in America on different types of resources that once belonged to Indian reservations. But by paying the money, would that still uh, preserve their their life, and I think that's that's their argument. They want to preserve what they already have: their culture, their identity, their lake. Money surely wouldn't buy that. Uh, no, money won't buy that. But uh, it's a case of balancing the interests. You know, I uh, look. I have sympathy with with them and what they're trying to do. But but where does the where does the public interest really lie? That's what I think that we have to consider at this point in time because we make a lot better use and more of a multiple use of the water uh, within this irrigation district than I think is possible in Pyramid. We not only use it for agricultural purposes, but we have an enormous amount of recreational use, swimming, boating, water skiing, picnicking, overnight camping, and fowl hunting and that sort of thing. So uh, the only thing we can do, uh, as I say, is to try to recognize that if they've been wronged, generally in these situations, or specifically in the pyramid situation, they should be compensated. How much money would you give them? I have no idea what it would be, but I can say this, that in other settlements that have been made with Indian uh, tribes, uh, uh, and there have been some very recent ones, they've run into uh, many millions of dollars. Today, the Washington bureaucracy, having plundered the Indians' water, and then having failed to do the bidding of the highest court in the nation and get the water back, has built on the reservation a concrete, automated, six million dollar fish complex which drains energy, creates pollution, and is meant to do what nature did for nothing until man intervened. Thank you.
When explorer John Fremont and his guide Kit Carson arrived at Pyramid Lake in January 1844, the Paiute people gave them a welcoming feast of the giant cutthroat trout, which grew up to four feet long and swam nowhere else in the world. That unique fish died with the greed of Derby Dam. For six million dollars, just three fish today, where there once were thousands. Nowadays they put the different kind of fish in our lake. They don't taste good. We taste it, they bring them to a senior citizens dinner place and we taste it, little tiny fishes. Don't taste good, white meat. I don't like to eat them. So with their livelihood dying and their culture vanishing, the Indians are finally having to come round to the ways of the white man. They now eat the new breed of automated, tasteless fish which they hate, and Kentucky Fried Chicken. And their menfolk go to the white man's wars. In Vietnam, more Indians died proportionately than any other Americans. They were all drafters. They had to. They had to go. What did you feel when they went off to war, fighting for their country? Oh, well, we didn't feel anything because the older people told us not to feel bad and not to cry. If you cry, you say they'll get killed in the war. That was the old saying. So, so, so didn't cry. No, we gave them dinner and then left. They left to the old. A lot of them still died. They come home and then they don't leave very long after they get home. Then my older boy died from wounds that he got in Vietnam. And he's been sick with it since he came back. And he died? Mm -hmm. He died lately, not oh, about two years ago, maybe. And. Did you have any other sons or no. you fought in the war? Mm. And what about your, your husband? He's dead too, isn't he? Yeah, he volunteered and they didn't want, you know, married, married uh, boys to go when he, wanted, he was young and he wanted to see what it was about, I guess. So we made an arrangement. He could go over. I let him go over. And in the First World so War? That's, I he had good experience, I guess, and he <clears> liked it. And that was the end. <laughs> he, he died in, in France, France or someplace, he? and they shipped him back here, you know, for burial. It's sad. A lot of Indians fight in wars, mm -hmm. don't they, in foreign wars? Why is that? Why do they volunteer? And just like all young people, they want to see the world, I guess. And they think they're fighting for their country. Yeah. In a way, they are. What else can we do? We can't do any more than what we're doing now. We just as well live with, with the white people and get along with them and do as they what they do. And I think they treat us better if we do. But if we start fighting them, they're going to terminate all the Indians, and then we won't have no place to go. They should terminate us in a minute if we start fighting back. What do you mean, terminate you? They just tell us to get out and help ourselves like they do other people, like the colored people. So you feel that while you're yeah. on the reservation, you're uh -huh. protected? Because this reservation do belong to the government. And they tell it's ours, but they still belong to the government. They can take it away from us if they want to. That's no fooling. <laughs> That's the truth. They can push us right out. This brand new school was built on the edge of the reservation because the whites living in a nearby town demanded it for their children. The school teaches only the American way of life, 
and for the Paiute, the school represents defeat at last. For the children of a nation of people who have been fishermen and hunters for thousands of years must now assimilate, which means they will go to the bottom of the heap in the supermarket society. Or they can cling to their dying lake. In fact, they have no choice, because either way they will vanish in the last stages of what some might call assimilation, but which I would prefer to call inevitable extermination. When the Bureau of Indian Affairs was first formed last century, I think they said in their charter that uh, one of the aims was to, quote, alienate children from their culture and their language. Now, a lot has happened since then, but has that fundamentally changed? Well, I'm not sure that, um, that it really has. Um, the people here are essentially concerned about what happens to their children. Mm -hmm. um, are they going to lose cultural background and um, what happens to them if we don't do something to encourage these things to continue? Uh, what do you do to encourage their culture? We have several programs. Um, one is through Title IV that you experienced this afternoon. They come in <clears throat> and they provide us with um, consultants. They come in and they teach the children how to do beadwork. Uh, some of the uh, older people come in and also teach the uh, teachers how to teach the children to do Indian fry bread. <laughs> So today the Paiu children are being taught to behave in the white man's phony Hollywood image of Indians. This tom-tom dance is not Paiu, and the drummer is a social worker from another Indian nation as absurdly foreign to the Paiu as the Greeks are to the English. And his dance is meaningless to them. By the way, the final irony of this story is that these defeated people actually think they are going to win out in the end. The last chairman of the Pyramid Lake Tribal Council was a young man called James Vidovich, whose father, desperate to adopt the ways of the white man, took the name of his Yugoslav employer. At a recent public inquiry into water rights at Pyramid Lake, James Vidovich addressed the white man with these words. You are not content with the damage you have already done, so long as there is a lake, a stream, a forest, a grassland, you must manage it. You must dam it, channel it, forest it. Can you not leave one thing untouched? Can you not leave one people alone? Can you not honor one promise? Can you not respect even one stream, one nearly extinct breed of fish, and one natural lake? We have rights too, rights to life that you cannot bestow because they were not yours to give. You would take even those from us. I read that because James Vidovich has refused to appear in this film. He doesn't trust me. He doesn't trust any white man anymore. <laughs> 